I wonder what it would be like to be born in a manger. Yeah. I wonder whatever happened to baby Jesus. He, he grew up. What? Wait. So you're saying that the baby Jesus Christmas story is the same as the adult walk on water Jesus? Yeah. Thanks, honey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow, I just never really put the two concepts together. <laughs> Wonder what happened to that guy, huh? <laughs> he, he went to the cross. That's the same guy? Yeah. So what you're saying is baby Jesus is the same as cross Jesus? Yeah. I mean, there's some time in there, right? I mean, he, he grew up, he taught people, he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross and came back to life. And, you know, now he lives in our hearts. That's the same guy? The Jesus that lives in our hearts? Okay, I was really, oh, wow. Okay, I never really put all those guys together, you know? Only one guy. I tell you this, here's an idea. Maybe we stop just making Christmas all just this once a year isolated thing, but we make it an ongoing story about the salvation in our hearts and lives. Up top. It's the idea. So if you were with us last week, we were talking a little bit about the pieces of Christmas, and, and we took a moment to kind of uh, reflect on and look at the stable and try to draw um, some parallels there that, that looking at the stable is a reminder that Jesus came to us and he didn't come sheltered. Um, he, he was exposed to all of the hardships and, and difficulties and struggles that you and I are exposed to, that he, he faced all of those things that you and I struggle with, face Yet he did it without sin, but he understands us. And, we, and we're told and we're reminded that we have a Savior that sympathizes with our weaknesses. He understands the things that we struggle with. And, and then we looked from the stable, we kind of peeked inside and we looked at the manger. And we're reminded that when, when Jesus takes up residence, he takes what's ordinary, which is that feeding trough, and it becomes extraordinary. And so in that picture, we see what God wants to do in each of us, that he wants to take ordinary people and he wants to place his presence in our lives through faith and, and allow us to be someone extraordinary, to have extraordinary purpose to our lives. And so today with uh, Christmas only five days away, as if you needed that reminder, um, we're going to slow down a little bit. And, and hopefully we can connect the dots and appreciate the, that, the powerful purpose of Christmas. Last week we talked about the pieces. Today we want to talk a little bit about the purpose. And, and as Christians, um, it's really, it's important. Um, I, I love that skit because as Christians we can kind of get things kind of all muddled and, and, and we just kind of zip through things and we don't slow down and connect the dots of what does this mean? What did Christ's birth? What's the implications for us as Christians today? Those, those events, those incredible events that unfolded in and, and near the town of Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, how, why does that still resonate, or why should it resonate with us? And this morning, um, if you're here and you don't know Christ, if you've never come to that place in your life where you've accepted Jesus, I, I will, I, my hope, my prayer, is that God's Spirit will just invade your heart. Um, and, and through the scriptures that we look at and, and through God's Spirit, that, that you'll come to understand your need uh, for a Savior. And, and I, I'm a big believer that if you understand the implications of Christmas, you can't resist the Christ of Christmas. You, you, you can't just kind of push past it. And, and maybe if you're here and you don't know Jesus, and I don't know if that's the case with anybody, but if that's the case, you've actually been celebrating Christmases without really understanding its purpose and its power. You know, it's kind of a nice holiday and there's a lot of festivities, but, but without really truly understanding what God's intention for us was. Um, I was preparing the message and, and I was reminded of, of just how powerful Christmas is. It's actually, it's the only holiday that we celebrate that has an entire season attached to it, when you think about it. 
we have the Christmas season. So think about all the other holidays we celebrate. We don't say that. We don't have a Valentine's season. Thank God, right, guys? We don't have a, we don't. We have a Valentine's Day. We have a day, right? We don't have independence. We don't celebrate independence season. We, we celebrate independence day. And, and, and so this is just a, a powerful thought. During the Christmas season, just think about all of the things that happen during this time of the year. Billions of people set aside their normal routines to decorate their homes and, and to attend Christmas parties and to, to buy gifts and send greeting cards and, and attend church services and sing Christmas carols and watch Hallmark movies and, and you know, all those, all those things and travel long distances to be with their families. There are actually, and, and some of you have come across these if you've been to the mall, some of the malls and stuff, there are actually stores and there are careers dedicated to the Christmas season. Like, that's, that's all they do, which is just... Amazing to me. When you think about Christmas, it, it's really, it's something you, you know, you, you can't miss. It's, it's everywhere. So think about this for a second. This simple, unassuming birth of a peasant boy born 2,000 years ago in a back alley town in the middle of the Middle East still has such a purpose to it and, and has caused such a stir. Think about the implications. Just just from a, you know, not even really a spiritual side, just think about the implications. Whether you realize it or not, every time you check a date on your calendar or enter one, you reference Jesus Christ's birth as a point of reference. Everything. I mean, that's why we have B.C. and A.D. and people are like, I know, well, now they're, they're kind of pushing B.C.E., you know, before Common Era. B.C., before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, in the, in, the, in the year of our Lord. But now, you know, like, well, they're trying to change that B.C.E. and C.E. The cool thing about that is they can change the wording that's freight. Guess whose life they're still using for dating? Jesus, which is, I mean, I don't get all hung up. I, I, I hope they wouldn't change the date. I, I understand. But it's still, he's the point of reference, that's power when you can split time where everything that's happened before Jesus appeared shows up as B.C. and everything after Jesus' appearance on the earth is A.D. Think about that. Just think about your own life. Your own birthday is related to his. Your date of birth has reference to his date of birth. That's why you were born in whatever year that was and, and those kinds of things. The night... Jesus was born in Bethlehem. A, a small group of shepherds were, were quietly tending their flocks of sheep in a nearby field. And, and you have to imagine, you know, try to put yourself in their, I was going to say shoes, sandals maybe, whatever they wore. Try to put yourself in, in, in their place and think about what was probably taking place that evening as they gathered. And, and it was probably just like any other night, you know, some of the same people gathering around that same you know, campfire and some of the same stories and, and the same stars they've been staring at for, you know, thousands of evenings before. And all of a sudden, what would happen would not only change their lives, but would change billions of other people's lives. The world would never be the same. Suddenly, a, a bright light lights up the sky and an alien of sorts. And this angel from God appears and begins speaking to them. And the Bible story. Luke chapter 2 it says this, and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were, great, great, they were filled with great fear. I thought I always loved this story because we always get this idea of this, of this you know, beaming light from, from this angelic you know, appearance. And, and, and there's truth to that, but I love what that line says, that it was the glory of the Lord that shone around them, that it, the angel himself has no glory, but it's the glory of God that shone around them. And it just how, you remember, remember the, the story of Moses up on Mount Sinai as he would receive the Ten Commandments and, 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 and God would pass, and, and, and it would say that when Moses came down that mountain with those tablets, that they had to put a veil on his face because the glory of God that still reflected from his face was blinding. They had to cover him up. I can't even imagine what it would have been like on a pitch black night in the middle of a field when this light just beams out of heaven. And it's the glory of the Lord that's just shining through. The angel said to them, fear not. Great first words, right? Because fear was certainly present. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. I I love the angel's words, right? We always go to those words this time of the year. And he says that Christmas would bring great joy to all the people. And I I always wonder, really? Because... I'll be honest with you, I'm guilty of this sometimes, but I see a lot of people who Christmas appears to be more of a hassle than it is a source of happiness, that, that it becomes a, a source of stress, that, that there seems to be more pressure involved than pleasure involved. Matter of fact, I, I even hear people say, make comments, I'm enduring the holidays rather than enjoying Christmas. The angel said that it would, be, it would bring great joy to all the people. And I know this time of year, there's, there's numerous fe- reasons why, why we may be feeling, you know, hurried and hassled and stressed and pressure and, and all those kinds of things. And, and you know, there's, there's a, probably a list of reasons. If I asked you if that's how you're feeling a little bit, you could probably, you know, hand me a list of reasons. Some of them, maybe, you know, you have to spend, you know, you're going to spend time with some oddball relatives and stuff. You know, no offense to the oddball relatives present today, but, but yeah, it, that may be the case. Sometimes there's really just difficult and strained family relationships, so it becomes really awkward. You know, we, we gather for Christmas and everybody's like trying to put on the face, but there's this awkwardness about it. Maybe there's somebody you're, 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 you're spending Christmas alone, or, or I don't know about you guys, but sometimes Christmas reminds you sometimes. I've talked with people, they're, they're reminded of losses and hurt and how much things have changed. You know, that, that becomes such a... Sometimes Christmas becomes a difficult thing to really celebrate for some people. They may not have a religious background that even includes Christmas. So, or they don't have faith at all. They don't have uh, faith in Christ. They, they're not, they, don't, they haven't accepted Christ. They don't understand the story so much. And so all this celebration and all this talk about Jesus becomes really awkward and uneasy for them. You know, it's just a weird thing. It's like, hey, I, I want to celebrate. I want to have a good time. But I don't want this Jesus part in it. It's just an awkward thing for them. Maybe you're just exhausted and worn out from all that's happened up to this point this year. And celebrating Christmas just becomes like one more thing to do. It's like, okay, it's five days away. I got to work myself up for it. We got to do this. Let me share with you this morning. I know that God cares about what you're wrestling with, and and I do too. But I I want you to know, regardless of your circumstances or, or pressures or stresses or whatever it is, let me just share something with you, and and I want us to really just try to wrap our heads and our hearts around it. Christmas is absolutely the very best news you and I could ever get in our lives. It really is. The message of Christmas is the absolute best news you and I could get, because underneath all of the visible sights and sounds of Christmas are these really simple but profound truths, and those things can transform our lives for the better here, but certainly for forever and eternity, the truths that lie underneath the, all the sights and sounds of Christmas. Right now, nothing more important for us than to understand the implications of Christmas for our lives. And so for a few minutes this morning, I want us to just slow down. I want us to take time and, and pause and, and, and ponder just the power and the, and the purpose of Christmas. Because if you've never received Christ, today you're going to... Uh, I pray for the first time maybe ever, you're going to understand the power and the purpose of Christmas. Maybe you have received Christ, you know Christ, and you just need to be reminded of what this season is about. Before all of the other things just overtake us and overwhelm us, we'd be reminded that the Christmas gift we've been given is the best gift we've ever been given. Think about this real quick. God, think about the qualities that, that this Christmas gift that God offers to us. Think about the qualities that make it just incredibly unique. So make some statements to you and let you just kind of wrap your, try to wrap your head around them. First of all, the gift that God offers us through his son at Christmas is the most expensive gift you will ever receive in your life. You have never received a more expensive gift than that. It's priceless. It costs Jesus his life. You will never have a more expensive gift. It's the only gift, believe it or not, it's the only gift that will literally last forever. 
like all the you know, Christmas sweaters and ties and all, don't last forever. Praise God, hallelujah, right? You know, right? We, were, we, were talk, we were talking a little bit about, the, Ms. Dr. Berg was talking about, um, you know, some of the things that our mind tells us we need, and then we get older and we realize we don't need those things, and, and the first thing that popped into my mind was parachute pants, like parachute pants, <laughs> like, you know, like back in the 80s, had to have them, got to have them. Now, not so much, not, not, not even, don't even, I'm not even tempted by that stuff. But when we think about, when we think about the gift of, that, Christ, that God offers us in Christ, it really is. It's, it's, first of all, it's the most expensive gift you'll ever receive. Secondly, it's the, the only gift that will actually literally last forever. Third, it's actually a very practical gift. The gift of life in Christ is a very practical gift. It's something you will use every single day. Hopefully something we value every single day. So on that first Christmas night, the angel announced some powerful purposes for the birth of Jesus. And I want us to just kind of focus in on one of those. And here's, here's, here's one, right? Here's something that the angel helps us understand, that Christmas is a time to celebrate. And I know, you know, it's not earth-shattering news. We've, all, we've just covered that. Billions of people set aside time every year to, to celebrate Christmas. And, but the interesting thing is, is while billions of people on the globe set aside time to celebrate Christmas, the actual one that we should be celebrating gets missed somehow, which is kind of ironic when you think about it. We're going to celebrate Christmas, but we're going to do so without the Christ, which is amazing. A recent survey of Christmas shoppers was taken, and they were asked a question, and it was a simple question. What are you celebrating this Christmas? Most of their answers had nothing to do with Jesus. Let me share with you some of the answers. I'm celebrating that I made it through another year. I'm celebrating being home with my family. I got a Christmas bonus. My son is home from Afghanistan. I'm celebrating that I finished all my shopping. I'm not celebrating anything. I'm just trying to survive the holidays. And none of these things are bad things. But at Christmas, there is a greater purpose for our celebration. There's actually a greater person for us to celebrate. Let me remind you of the angel's words to the shepherds that revealed God's incredible news for us. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. The angel says, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. So so think, I mean, just looking at that statement, there's, there's at least three reasons right there that we can celebrate Christmas. First of all, the message of Christmas is personal. I bring you. I bring you. Each and every one of you. I bring you. It's, it's a personal message. And I know it's something that we, we think about and, and we're like, man, that's awesome that Jesus came to the earth. He did. He came for you personally. <clears throat> Here's another reason it's worth celebrating. It's a positive message. So I bring you good news of great joy. That's powerful. I don't know about you guys. We could all use a little more good news, right? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to avoid turning on my TV much anymore. Uh, I, I even hate the news Facebook feeds, right? Another shooter, another situation, another. It's just, man, good news of great joy. Here's another reason that Christmas is worth celebrating. Not only is it personal and positive, The message of Christmas is universal for all people. There's not a single person that has ever lived or will ever live on the the face of the earth that this message isn't intended for, which is such a blessing and a good thing to be reminded of this time of year. You know, when we huddle and we do our little Christmas things and we're so grateful that God gave us this gift, and that's a good thing, but understand that that gift wasn't supposed to stop with you. It was supposed to make it to all people. It's supposed to be spread to all people. Matter of fact, the shepherds give us such an incredible testimony and and witness and an example. Remember what they did? Anybody remember what they did right after seeing Jesus? Anybody remember? Kind of one of those trivia things. What was the next thing they did? They went and spread the news. That was the, they, they went and saw the Messiah for themselves. They saw the Christ for themselves. They, they kneel down and they worship the Messiah. And they get up from there and they go and tell others about him. That's, man, that's compelling for us as Christians, right? 
It's not enough to come together on a Sunday morning and huddle and worship, and it's not enough to come together with our families around the, you know, the Christmas tree and huddle and worship. Those are good things, but it can't stop there. It was never intended to. This is good news for all people. Doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, or where you're headed. This is news for us, and it's news that's worth celebrating. Christmas is a time to celebrate that, that God loves you. The, the most famous statement, think about this for just a second. The most famous statement in all of the Bible is Jesus' explanation of why God the Father sent him to earth. The most famous verse in all of the Bible is Jesus explaining why the Father sent him. Remember that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I shared Wednesday night that this is my favorite Christmas verse because it's the Christ explaining the purpose for which he came, explaining why, what motivated him to come to this earth. What was the, what was the, the catalyst behind Jesus showing up? The entire reason for Christmas is the love of God. The entire reason. I know a lot of times we're sucked into believing it's other thing. It's like it's a really great economic stimulus, you know, to our, uh, and it probably is. But that wasn't the reason Jesus came. The re- Jesus didn't come for us to, you know, buy more stuff and have more decorations. Those are fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But don't let it distract you from the real purpose behind it. God loves us so much that he came to earth as a human so we could get to know him and so that we could get to trust him and so that we could love him back. Think about this. God designed us, right? He could have communicated his love in a thousand different ways to us, but because he knows us and because he designed us, he knew the most effective way to communicate his love was face to face. So he came in person powerful. That's powerful. The Bible tells us that Christ Jesus, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And I I don't know about you all, but it's good this time of year to be reminded of what a significant step down this was for a holy God. To wrap him, to not only come to this earth, I'm thinking, if I'm a holy God, I'm coming to the earth, but I'm not touching anything. You know, I'm just going to hover above it because this is, every, they, people have screwed this up. I, I'm not, that's not what he did. He came in person. He humbled himself, took the position of a slave, was born, wrapped himself in flesh, and then lived through all the stuff that you and I lived through and touched the people that we believed were untouchable and, and dined with those that maybe we would kind of be repulsed by. But he, he came in person to share a personal message. He didn't send an angel or an ambassador. He didn't send a prophet or a priest. He came personally. I love that. Because in all other ideas and ideologies and, and, and mythologies and things like that, it's always about what us humans can do to somehow attain godship or to, to touch the gods. It's always about that. Christianity is the only one that says, no, you can't, God, so God came to you. He wrapped himself in flesh and met you face to face. There's something about that. There's something about that that has to draw us. There's something powerful about that. If you really want people to know how much you love them, you remember, like, I remember, like, the old, like, commercials, right? Was it Hallmark or whatever? It was like, say it with a card. God's like, no, 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 say it personally. Cards are nice. Say it personally. And that's what God did. That's what God did at Christmas. He came and and shared and expressed his love personally. The one potential problem we have in our annual Christmas celebrations is is kind of like the video depicted. We we lose track of Jesus a little bit. We, We just kind of Jesus the baby, Jesus the little baby in the manger, baby Jesus. You know, we just kind of get stuck in that place. And we continue to, a lot of times we just continue to see him as that child in the manger. And while God loved us so much to come wrapped in human flesh and, and wrapped as a baby in swaddling cloths, he didn't stay there. Think about this for just a second. If Jesus had never grown up to do what he did, he would not have the power to transform our lives. Wouldn't. A baby in and of itself doesn't do that. 
Now, some of you that have children or have had children, you can probably say, no, wait a second, our lives transformed drastically when we had this little child. That's not the kind of transformation God's seeking. He's not trying to transform your schedule. He's trying to transform your life. And, and that's what he's trying to get to us, to help us understand that there was more to the story. Jesus grew to manhood. He modeled for us the kind of life that pleases God. He taught us the truth. He paid for every sin we have ever or will ever commit by dying on a cross and then proved that he was God and could save us by rising from the grave three days later. That's the good news. That's the good news that we have to embrace and we have to share and we have to rally around this time of year. At Christmas, we celebrate that God loved us so much that he would humble himself and come as a baby, but that's just a part of the incredible love story. One of the most beloved Christmas carols is the song, What Child Is This? You guys know that? Remember the song? It was written in 1865 by an Englishman named William Dix. Most of us are familiar with the first verse, right? What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap? We, we, we know the first verse because it deals with the birth of Jesus. The, the unfortunate thing is we rarely ever sing the next stanza. And matter of fact, if you were looking at your hymnal right now, it's a little bit disappointing because they cut off the second verse in our hymnal. They only gave us half of what the second verse actually says. But let me show you the, what the verse, the full verse is that William Dix wrote back in 1865. He wrote this. Why lies he in such mean a state where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christian fear for sinners here. The silent word is pleading. Now, if you were to look in our hymnals, it would revert back to this, this is Christ the Lord. It would go back to that. But the original stanza says this. Nails Spear shall pierce him through. The cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail, the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. That's powerful. That's power. I, I, I love that this author, that this writer, takes us to the manger and in the next breath takes us to the cross. Because let me share with you, without a cross, the manger doesn't mean much. God loved us so much that he gave us his son. He sent Jesus to show us who God is with skin on. Isn't that incredible? I, I just, that blows my mind. That, that when people would, would, would stand before Christ or would, would slide up next to Jesus or would have conversations, they're speaking with holy God himself. Wow. God's love went beyond Jesus, just giving up heaven to come to us. He gave up even more. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is Romans 5.8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank God that's the way it works because we would never be able to come to him except that we were invited as we were still sinners. He never asked us to clean ourselves up, get perfected, and then somehow make our way to him. The love of our Savior compelled him to leave heaven, live among us, and then go to a cross. It's powerful. Christmas is a time to celebrate that God loves you. Christmas is a time to celebrate that God is with you. And I know this time of year, for a lot of people, it can become a really lonely time of year. It can become tough if you're, if you're away from your family or, or, or whatever the scenario or the situation may be. And, and this morning, you may be here, and sometimes you can feel... Like God is a million miles away, right? Let me share with you. God's presence, and if you don't hear anything else, hear this this morning. If you're here and you're a believer this morning, God's presence in your life has nothing to do with your feelings. I just want to be just honest with you. God's presence, if you're here and you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, your feelings do not dictate God's presence. That's not how it works. You may feel like he's a million miles away, but let me share with you, the one that's moved isn't him. He pledges and he promises he never will. Our emotions are susceptible to all kinds of influences. So they are often, often, often unreliable. Unreliable. Some of the worst advice you will ever be given in your life, and I encourage you, do not heed it, is do what you feel. Don't even do what you feel is right. Because your emotions are rarely right or trustworthy or real. You're, you're drawing conclusions from, from outside influences that aren't there and promising you the truth. Our feelings can be indicators.
they should never be dictators. And by that, I mean, our feelings can indicate where you're at at the moment, but they should never be given the, the power to dictate our behavior nor our beliefs. Does that make sense? Our feelings can indicate things. We can kind of go, wow, man, I'm just, I'm feeling a bit, you know, stretched or, or stressed or, or out of sorts. That's an indicator. It shouldn't dictate what you believe or how you behave. Fear is one of the feelings that seems to be such a driving and debilitating force, not only in our lives, but in the world today. It just seems like there's just this constant feeding on fear. All of the what ifs hold us hostage from actually realizing what is. So we, we do that a lot. Well, what if, and what if, and what if? Step back a second and listen to what God says is, what is, instead of constantly coming to him with all well, the what ifs. Well, what if that doesn't work out? And what if this doesn't happen? And what if, listen to what God says. Listen to the truth of what is. In the midst of our loneliness and fear, Christmas is a good time to be reminded that God is with us. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, whether you feel it or not, God is with you. Whether you feel it or not. David wrote these powerful words in Psalm 139, verse 7. He says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. And if you read that psalm, David was trying. <laughs> like he was trying to get away. He, he wanted to distance himself from God's presence and God's spirit in the moment. He says, I can't do it. No matter what I try, I can't get away from you. And I know in, in David's case, he was almost lamenting the fact. In our case, we should celebrate the fact, I hope. that You know what? No matter where you're at, if you've accepted Christ, he's with you. There's nowhere you can go. There's nothing you can experience that God has, has not with you in it. The skill that we have to sharpen is to connect or tune into God's presence in our lives. And that is a skill you can learn. That's a learnable skill. And it, and it really has nothing to do with your feelings. It has a whole lot to do with the truth of God and his word. When I think about Christmas, I think about the prophecy of Christ's birth that, that was given to Isaiah, and it was given to Isaiah like 700 years before Jesus would be born. And, and God would reveal to Isaiah that Jesus would be given several names. And, and I don't know about you guys, when, if, you, if you're parents, um, it, the, the pro, what the process was like when you were naming your kids. Um, usually it was, I know for Carrie and I, we joke about it, we picked names that didn't rhyme with something. So <laughs> it, was, it was just, we just know how kids can tease other kids. So, you know, it was, you know, there's no Patricias in here this morning, right? So there was like, like Fatty Patty, like, so, you know, you know, those kinds of crazy things. That can, so we're like, okay, let's think of some names and let's think what they don't rhyme with, you know, or, or they can't rhyme with or something like that. Or, or a lot of times we'll pick names we like or we'll, we'll pick names, we'll choose names that honor a relative or a loved one. We, we did that in, 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 our, in our family. Caitlin's middle name was a, was a middle name of, of, of her, her, Carrie's mom and, and my mom both had the same middle name. And then my grandmother had that same middle name. So we just felt like, and, and if you ever ask, ask Caitlin what her name, middle name is, and she loves it. Um, but it's the one she's stuck with. Um, so that's kind of the process that we go through. When God revealed the names that would be given to Jesus, he was actually revealing Christ's purpose, which is awesome. Like, like, like the names are amazing. I mean, they're cool names. They're probably not names we'd name our kids, but they're, they're cool names, but they had purpose to them. There was a reason that name would be given to Christ. And he gives us several names in the book of Isaiah, but here's one of the names that Isaiah shared with us, and it's found in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. He says this, he says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And that's a powerful name. That's a powerful name. Anybody know, what, what does that name mean? You guys probably know. God is with us. Yeah, so no wonder the very first words the angel speaks to the shepherds is fear not. Because just think about that. If God is with us, then all of our fear and stress and panic and what ifs and doubts should melt away with the presence of an almighty God in our lives, right? I mean, and I know we're human, we still have all this stuff. But it's really not logical in a real sense. 
I appreciate Brother, Brother Scott used to teach us about fear years ago when we were at Redlands a Church in California. And I remember him telling us one time in a, in a study, he said, fear is nothing more than false evidence appearing real. It was like an acronym. Man, is that ever true? The things that we doubt and the what-ifs and the fears and the stresses and all the things we just agonize over in the presence of an almighty God in your life, where does that stuff stack up? It, sh it should melt away. For whatever reason, when, when that angel spoke to those shepherds and said, Fear not, for behold, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. And this is going to be good news of great joy. You know what they did? They trusted that. And they acted on it. And they made their way to this manger and they worshipped. They didn't step back and go, Well, what if, what if he doesn't like the way we're dressed? Or the way we smell? Or, or, or what if he's not all that I thought he would be? They just responded to a message. And they responded out of faith, not out of fear. I don't know all the things that, that each of you may have encountered in your lives up to this point. And I know with some conversations with a few of you, some of you guys have shared some, some areas of your life where it's like, man, I've, uh, there's some, some things that, some areas where there's been abandonment, you know, by by friends or, 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 or parents or spouse or, or your children or whatever it is. What I do know is that everyone has faced the pain and heartache of being left to some degree. Everybody's had that to some level. They've had something that they or someone that they believed would be there for them. And then when, you know, when, when things got crazy, when things really kind of you know, got out of hand, that person wasn't there any longer. Just about everybody has faced that to some degree, to some level. We helped Caitlin face it early in her life. We left her here at the church one day, drove all the way to town, and she was six years old. We just wanted to make sure she understood what it felt like. To, no, I'm just kidding. That was a total. I wish it was like this real spiritual lesson. It was, I thought you had her. I thought you had her. We don't have her. And so, so that was crazy. But everybody has, has experienced that pain and that heartache. And I'll be honest with you, as a dad, to this day, I wish I could push this out of my memory, but I can't. And maybe it's there for a good reason. I still remember what her face looked like and the words she said to me. I do. Like, man, I wish I could just blot that out, but I can't. I remember I, I, I joke about it, and Tim wasn't the police chief in town at the time, which is fortunate, because at the, at, I, I caught air at the top of the hill by the golf course, because the little car back then... It would do 120 pretty easily, and, and there it was. So uh, I'm confessing. Can you arrest me for past stuff? <laughs> Confession's good for the soul and good for being arrested, I suppose. Um, but I can just remember pulling into the drive, and all we had was the other building, the upper building at the time. Um, and... And my thoughts, if you've ever had that happen as a parent, you've kind of, you know, maybe it's been a grocery store or a department store, and for that quick second your kid gets away and all that stuff, well, that, that, that lasted longer than it should have because it was several minutes that had gone by. And I can just remember, I, I thought I was going to see her walking along the highway, you know, or, or something along that way because she knew where home was and, you know, kind of knew, to, you know, that she could go that way. She wasn't, so it pulled into the drive and kind of power slide into the, into the, into the fellowship center. And, and I remember she comes around the, the corner of the building, and with tears just streaming down her face, she says, Dad, you left me. <laughs> Man, talk, as a six-year-old, she just had me just worked over. I was like, I know, I'm such a horrible parent. If you've ever experienced the heartache and the pain of being left, I really want you to listen to the words in the heart of God. In Hebrews 13, 5, listen to what it says. For God himself has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. And when God says never, he means never. There's no, oh, I thought you had him. I, oh, I was, there's none of that. One of God's greatest promises in the Bible is this. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God. I love, uh, can I, I'm not, I'm not much of a grammar fiend. I love the comma after Lord. I love it. 
Because a lot of times we hear, you know, the title, Lord your God, Lord your God. We hear that. He says, I am the Lord, your God, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now, let me help you understand something real quick in, in the text. He has to be your Savior. He has to be your Lord. He has to be your God for this to be true for you. And that's the difficult thing we have sometimes in Christianity is we take these texts and we make them kind of almost applicable to the entire group, you know, everyone. That's not true. That was a promise that God made to his children, to those that call him God, that have him as a savior. So, so let me help you just connect the dots there. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, he wants this to be true of you. He wants this to be true for you. I don't know what difficulties you feel like you're drowning in right now if you're a believer here this morning. I don't know what hot spots you may be dealing with in your life. What I do know is that God cares, he understands, and he is going through it with you. He promises. Anybody else? I love, I love how often the word through shows up in those verses. When you go through... Not when you meet and end at a dead end. He says it's through. It's through. One of my one of my favorite passages, right? When we hear it often read and, and quoted at funerals, David would write the 23rd Psalm, and he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Not into, with no way out, through. Man, that's such a powerful thing to know that we have a God that promises to walk through it with us. You're not alone. If there's anything we can gather from that, you are not alone. The message of Christmas is that God is near, that he came to us, that he wants a relationship with us, that Christmas is a time to celebrate that God loves you, God is with you, and that God is for you. It's interesting to note how many times the phrase for you shows up in the Bible. Many times uh, when Jesus would meet people, his first words to them were often this question. What do you want me to do for you? He asked that question often. When, when someone would, would approach him with whatever you know, ailment or, or issue, they would approach him and his question would be, what do you want me to do for you? When Jesus first instituted the sacred ordinance of communion with his church, he said this. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. The Apostle Paul, he made this bold declaration in Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 31. He said, if God is for us, who can be against us? When you're facing difficulties and, and, and there's struggles and there's challenges and you're, and you're meeting, it's, it's really great to know that God is with you. You know what's equally great? To know that God's for you. Many people, believers and unbelievers alike, I don't know why, but there's this idea that God is secretly out to get us. That that's, that, that that's God's, you know, just his MO. That he's always just kind of hiding around the corner, waiting for us to mess up so he can spring out and just kind of slack us down or scold us. That that's how people see God. And, and the unfortunate thing is, sometimes that's true of believers. That they still have this idea that all God is doing is he's waiting for me to mess up so he can just jump into my life and discipline and punish and scold. Let me, let me share with you what God says. Because he tells us otherwise. Listen to his words from Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, for I know the plans I have for you. There are plans for good and not for a disaster. Not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. So I don't know where we come up with this idea that God is just waiting to just scold us and punish us. And that he's an angry God just waiting for people to mess up so he can just invade their lives with, with hurt and with hate and with all these things. That's not what he said. He said, I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for good and not for disaster. Now let me help you understand something real quick. God's idea of good and your idea of good aren't always the same thing. Let me share with you something else. God's idea of good is much better than your idea of good. Much better than my idea of good. I want you to know something. No one wants what's best for you more than God. Let me say that again, because some of us are like, like 
staring like blankly, like, huh? Seriously, no one wants what's best for you more than God. Not even you want what's best for you more than God. God wants what's best for you more than you do even. Think about, and I have to remember that as a husband and as a father and as a pastor and as a son and all these things that I think, well, I have their best in mind, so they should therefore listen to me. Let me share with you. If whatever I'm sharing is contrary to what God wants for you, he wants what's best for you. He wants what's best for you. Better, more than I do. No one knows better what will truly make you happy, healthy, and whole. Better than God. And I know a lot of people are like, well, is, does God really want us to be happy? I don't know. Jesus spent a lot of time talking about it in Matthew 5 when he started out with blessed are the, right? Blessed, happy, filled with life joy. So God wants that for us. Now he started, he turns the corner on what that means because we get down to the end of the Beatitudes and he talks about blessed are you when you're persecuted and we're like, wait a second, I don't think that's good for me. God says, it'll produce good. Don't go seeking it. But if you're living the right, right way and follow me the way you should be, it'll come. It'll be a part of your life, and I'm gonna, that's going to be something that will continue to move you towards joy and towards health and towards wholeness. God doesn't want us going through life crouching and hiding and covering up, afraid of him. That's not who God is. He doesn't watch one that's walking through life constantly in fear of him. He actually wants us to run to him, not from him. It's amazing to me how often believers and unbelievers have this incredible misconception about God that on some level many of us carry around this incredible guilt about all the things we've done wrong and so we try to avoid God or at least we try to be we try avoiding being open and honest with him as if God doesn't know right you know like we're just going to avoid God in this area of my life I just don't want to talk to him about it he knows and then as believers we say that we've trusted Christ for our eternity, and yet we fail to trust his love and forgiveness for every day. It's like, I trusted Christ to take care of me forever, but I can't come to him with this issue. I can't openly and honestly confess this to him now and the things that I'm struggling with. Unbelievers often feel like God is mad at them and is just waiting to lower the boom in their lives. I want us to just kind of understand something, understand the message of Christmas a little bit better if we can. The message of Christmas is this. God is not mad at you. He's mad about you. See, I don't know about you guys. If I'm really mad at somebody, I'm probably going to avoid them, right? I, I, I'm not going to hang out with them. I'm not going to come to them and hang out with them. I'm, I'm going to kind of keep my distance if I'm really mad. So Christmas, the message of Christmas is God can't be mad at us. He came to us. So he must be mad about us. He must be absolutely mad about us. Jesus said this. He said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He says, here's the reason that I came. I'm, I didn't come because I'm mad at you. I came because I'm mad about you. And I, want, I don't want to condemn. I want to save. I want to rescue you. If you study the Bible and begin to understand the heart of God and you see his heart lived out in the life of his son, Jesus, you'll quickly discover that when we mess up and when we make a mistake and when we fail and when we sin, God doesn't desire to rub it in. He actually wants to rub it out. He's not looking around going, wow, I wonder how I can just press this heart into the life and just load them up with even more guilt. I wonder how I can do that. He's like, no, I want that guilt to bring you to me so we can get this all cleared up and cleaned up and forgiven. Jesus came to forgive our sins and mistakes and failures. He came to save us, not to scare us. So if we have a religion or we have a belief that constantly keeps us frightened of God and his work in our lives. Let me share with you, your belief needs to change. Your religion isn't right. It doesn't square with what scripture says. That's why the very first statement the angel made to the shepherds was fear not. That the very first statement. His first statement wasn't, you stinking, no good, low down, sinning shepherds. It was fear not. I have good news of great joy. There is a Savior for you. And there's a Savior for all of us. And that's a reason to celebrate. As we close this morning, let me ask you, just think about real quick, 
What are you celebrating this Christmas? What are you celebrating? And like I said, the, that list that some of the shoppers gave, that's, that's not, that wasn't a bad list. Those weren't bad things. But if that's where your celebration begins and ends, you're missing out on the powerful purpose of Christmas. We, you, have the greatest reason in the world to celebrate. God loves you. God is with you. God is for you. Here's the most pressing question. Is God in you? Is God in you? See, I, I, don't, I don't believe God wants us to celebrate Christmas as outsiders, kind of peeking in through the window, you know? Kind of out in the dark and out in the cold and watching all of this happen. God wants us to be a part of that. He wants us to be a part of that celebration, and that happens as God is in us. The Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. He says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So the question is, has there been a moment when you have stopped and prayed and sincerely trusted Jesus as your Savior? Because if there hasn't been a moment where that took place, then let me share with you, that's the invitation this, this year for you for Christmas. Because there are so many things to experience and celebrate, but the greatest thing to experience and celebrate is our life in Christ and him in us through faith. That's the greatest thing. Of all the gifts that you can be offered and of all the gifts you can receive this Christmas, Jesus is the first and the most important and the greatest gift ever. Most expensive, most practical, just most rewarding. And maybe this Christmas... While you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, or maybe you're, you haven't made that decision, maybe you're struggling with, with reasons to celebrate and reasons to rejoice. I, I just love, I wanna, we're going to end with this, but I want us to, I just love Jesus' words in Luke 10, verse 20. He says, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I mean, if you're struggling with a reason to celebrate this Christmas, Jesus gives us the greatest reason ever. It's like you can, you can rejoice. You can celebrate because your name is written in heaven. And that's only possible because of Jesus. And it only happens when we put our faith in him. That's, that's a reason to celebrate. No matter where you're at, what your Christmas kind of looks at, there's reason to rejoice if we know Christ and we're secure in, his, in our relationship with him. And we know that he indwells us, that Christ is in us through faith. Let's pray. Father God, just thank you for the, just the, the powerful purpose behind Christmas, that it, was a, that it was an idea that was born by divine wisdom, that, that before even the foundations of the world were laid, you, you knew that you would send your son to this earth. And, and not just as a speaker and a... And, and kind of a, a person to, to rally people towards religion, but that you would send him as a baby born of a virgin, laid in a manger, worshipped by shepherds, adored by pagans, that you had a purpose for Christmas, and it was a purpose, it was great news, it was good news for, of great joy for all of us, that we could all embrace and understand and see that God loves us so much that he couldn't stand to stay apart from us, to stay distant, but that he came to earth to show us that, so we could see who God is with skin on, that we could understand that through his life and through his death on the cross and his resurrection, through faith in Jesus and what he did, that we could enter into this most amazing forever relationship with holy God. God, I pray this Christmas that we would just press pause and be reminded that while we look around and maybe we're struggling with reasons to celebrate and reasons to rejoice, that we can be reminded that there is a tremendous reason to rejoice if, our, if we have faith, if we have placed our faith and our confidence and our trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And Lord, that means that we have to be honest with our sin. We can't be saved until we recognize we need someone to save us. So God, maybe that's where somebody's struggling this morning, that this whole idea of Jesus as a Savior, it sounds nice, but they're just not sure and they're not certain of the fact that they need a Savior. God, would you, would you help them realize that we are all sinners in need of a Savior? That we have all sinned and fallen short of your righteous and holy standard? And that on our own, 
we can never make it to heaven, never live forever in your presence because we're sinners. But you sent your son to take care of the sin in our lives and to restore the relationship that's been broken. And it's only by faith that we attain that relationship by your grace through faith. God, I pray that everybody here has made that decision and that this Christmas they can really celebrate um, with their family, with their friends, those are great, but that the deeper purpose of Christmas just resonates in them and through them, that they have a Savior that was born. And it's good news, a great joy, and news they want to share and they, sh- they would need to share with others. God, thank you for our time together in your word. I pray uh, this Christmas we would be reminded again and again and again of your love, the fact that you love us, the fact that you're with us, and the fact that you're for us. God, we just love you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, guys.